The last class, uh, last week, uh, we explored the role of hope in spiritual life. And I spent some time contrasting what you might consider as egoic hope, which is hope that's fixated on certain things going well for myself or certain people. And it's usually got some grasping and some fear mixed into it. I contrasted that with what we might call spiritual hope. And spiritual hope perceives life as unfolding in a way of awakening consciousness. So there's some innate intelligence that's behind the unfolding and there's some trust in it and a love for that. And that that gives what we call spiritual hope. And and I like very much the way Hamid Ali, a wonderful teacher, described it. He said, hope is a state of trust that everything will be okay. It's a feeling of optimism, an attitude of openness and true receptivity to what the unfolding of being presents to us. Okay, so there's this egoic hope and then there's a kind of hope that really can uh, nourish our spiritual life. So I was on the phone with my mom a couple of days ago. Uh, those of you that come regularly, my mom's 87 and she's very often at this class sitting over here. And um, so she wanted to hear what I was giving talks on. So I told her about these, this talk on hope. And uh, she started humming. <laughs> so I thought I was boring her. And then she, came, then she burst out in song. And the song was... I'm stuck like a dope with a thing called hope and I can't get it out of my heart. (laughs) How many of you know South Pacific? Anyway, it's called the cockeyed optimist. So that was, so I thought I'd share that that's another version of egoic hope and I promised her I'd let you know my channel for Dharma teachings was her. (laughs) It's another version of hope springs eternal. so. So mature hope. It's not about fairness. It's not like if I work really hard on, on this project, there'll be a just reward. I, there's nothing about deserving in it. It's not that personal. I read in one rather strange newspaper uh, a, a small article about Percy the Pigeon uh, who flopped down exhausted in the Sheffield loft, having beaten 1,000 rivals in a 500-mile race, he was immediately eaten by a cat. The 90-minute delay in finding his remains and handing his identification tag to the judges relegated Percy from first to third place. <laughs> so it's not fair, right? <laughs> the basic teaching is that uh, emo- emotional hope hope that has our idea about the future and expectation that takes us away from presence is egoic. That's a sign when it takes us away from a real sense of what's happening here. Some of you might remember a story written by a bagpiper. He says, I play many gigs. Recently I was asked by a funeral director to play at a graveside service for a homeless man. He had no family or friends, so the service was to be at a pauper cemetery in a Kentucky back country. As I was not familiar with the backwoods, I got lost, and being a typical man, I didn't stop for directions. Finally arrived an hour late, saw the funeral guy had evidently gone and the hearse was nowhere in sight. There were only the diggers and crew left, and they were eating lunch. I felt badly and apologized to the men for being late. I went to the side of the grave and looked down, the vault lid was, and the vault lid was already in place. I didn't know what else to do, but I had a sense of something was possible, so I started to play. The workers put down their lunches and began to gather around. I played out my heart and soul for this man with no family and friends. I played like I've never played before for this homeless man, and I played Amazing Grace. The workers began to weep. They wept, I wept, we all wept together. When I was finished, I packed up my bagpipes and started for the car. Though my head hung low, my heart was full. As I opened the door to my car, I heard one of the workers say, I've never seen nothing like that before, and I've been putting in septic tanks for 20 years. (laughs) 
He writes, apparently I'm still lost, it's a man thing. <laughs> so it's not getting lost in some unreality. In fact, the, the best description of spiritual hope is what we're hoping for is the potential that's already here in this very moment. For me, the, one of the most direct framing of spiritual hope is in the Buddha's noble truths. The Buddha basically starts out with saying, suffering exists, it's one of these universal conditionings. The cause, we try to make things different than they are, we try to hold on or push away, grasping and aversion. The third noble truth is incredibly small and incredibly powerful. It says, freedom is possible it is possible for us to discover the truth of who we are and live in an expression of that freedom. That's the third noble truth. The fourth truth is, and here's how, and it explains through the Eightfold Path the different ways that we come home to realize our true nature. So, Buddhism, as with all, I think, all of the spiritual paths, different traditions, is innately hopeful. It's saying, this is possible. Okay. So I'd like to read, uh, this is Rumi's version of, of hope, of the third truth. I'd like to read, and then we'll do a brief reflection together. This poem is called, A Garden Beyond Paradise. Everything you see has its roots in the unseen world. The forms may change, yet the essence remains the same. Every wondrous sight will vanish, every sweet word will fade, but do not be disheartened. The source they come out from is eternal, growing, branching, giving new life and new joy. Why do you weep? That source is within you, and this whole world is springing up from it. Why do you weep? That source is within you, and this whole world is springing up from it. The source is full, its waters are ever flowing. Do not grieve, drink your fill. Don't think it will ever run dry. This is an endless ocean. So the, the message of, of all the paths is that what we long for, what we seek, what we love is always and already right here. It's an interior sacred presence that's right available when we learn to kind of let go and relax back into it. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The promise is something's possible. So let's reflect for a moment together. If you'll just close your eyes. And in the pause right now, just sense that you have this capacity to, to put aside some of the habitual conditioning or ways of thinking or skepticism and experiment a little. Because this is an experiment, this reflection. And we begin the experiment, as we often do with meditations, with, with simply contacting what's real and alive right here. So as we do with the meditation, just to feel the life of the body, just let yourself receive this life, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, just to feel the aliveness, a gentle attention. Let yourself receive the sounds that are here. Let your senses be awake and open so you receive this whole moment through the senses. Sensing as you experience this aliveness, the presence that's here, 
that quality of beingness, what Rumi calls that endless ocean of wakefulness. And with that, this creative possibility that emerges moment to moment when we're completely right here. And begin to ask yourself, what would it mean to feel the open-heartedness of hope? To really be open to possibility? to be optimistic. Just sense for a moment what that would mean, what it would be like. You might bring to mind the most hopeful person you know, someone who is hopeful in a spiritual way, and just let your experience co-mingle in the field with that person. So you're really trying on a deep sense of optimism, openness to possibility and paying attention. What's it like in your body to feel the open-heartedness of hope? What's your mind like when you're living in that receptivity and openness. Hope is sometimes described as an attitude of the soul, just to sense this attitude. All shall be well all matter of things shall be well. And as you close this exercise, just to let go of any judgments that might have come up as you experimented You can trust that whatever unfolds, we can learn from it. Take a few full breaths and come on back. So our inquiry tonight is what blocks us from hope? What gets in the way? And then, of course, how do we awaken hope? Because it's a capacity within all of us. And to begin to say that the ground of spiritual hope is really to experience our belonging, our connection to the universe, our belonging to aliveness, that feeling of direct sense of the flow of life inside us, and to sense that presence, what I call that that background of wakefulness that really is our own deepest being quality, the dimension of being, our formlessness. When we're in touch, when there's a remembrance of this sense of of immediacy, of aliveness and beingness, uh, when we're in touch, we're also in touch with the possibility that springs forth moment to moment. There's a sense of hopefulness. We're in Rumi's garden in those moments. There's a wonderful image that um, a friend I'm in correspondence with sent me. It's from the portal of the mystery of hope by Catholic theologian and poet Charles Pagey, or Pagey, I think is the way it's pronounced. And he envisions three young girls walking together and they're holding hands. And the youngest and most lively is in the middle and her name is Hope. The sister on one side is Faith and the sister on the other is Love. And he describes it that Hope often runs ahead and then has to wait for the other two to catch up, which I thought is kind of cool. 
And the teaching again is when we know our belonging, it's and our, our, our oneness, our connection to aliveness and presence, then this trinity of love, hope, faith naturally arises. And they're interpenetrating. In true spiritual hope, there is a sense of love for life, and there's a sense of trust in how life is unfolding. Okay, so the three sisters might be helpful as you consider this. So our trust, our hope, our love gets disabled, gets smothered, gets in some way contracted and contained if as a very young being our holding environment um, is not sensitive or responsive or attuned. This is our basic message from all the psychologies, is that it matters when we come into this world what kind of container we come into. And, and our basic sense of belonging will make it possible to have hope and trust. And if that's severed, then we find it's very hard to be hopeful about what's going to happen. And you can see it vividly in studies, uh, animal studies, of what happens with maternal deprivation in one with chimps. And I, and I always want to say that um, I share the outcomes of these studies and to do a study on chimps that involves maternal deprivation is cruel. And the results of it show the cruelty. The results are when a mother is not is distracted because she's not always able to get the food she needs and um, has her own problems, so she can't really attend in a consistent way to the chimp. The results are binge eating, antisocial behavior, anxiety, and depression. Sound familiar? (laughs) That's our society. Our holding environment with our parents and with the culture is one that's uh, addicted, violent, ADD culture, and of course, it permeates and, and, and creates the messages we get in our, in our family system. So if we were brought up in an environment where there was trauma or, or real st- abuse and violence and so on, our nervous system gets overwhelmed. To protect ourselves, we dissociate, we contract. There's a sense of powerlessness, of freeze, of hopelessness. In other words, We've disconnected from our beingness and are contracted in an armored state. We don't have access to the very beingness and aliveness that gives hope. That's when it's extreme. But even when it's not extreme, even when for most of us there were some judgmental messages, you should be this way and this way and don't be that way, and so we had to shape ourselves to get the approval and love we wanted, in that shaping process, we pull away from our beingness, from that openness and, and that basic presence and sense of aliveness and flow that gives hope. So there's a pulling away from beingness. And, this is the second part of the inquiry, we come back to a place of hope, of this kind of optimism which is so much necessary for healing. We come back to the place of hope with our sisters of trust and love as we begin reconnecting with beingness, with the presence and aliveness that's right here. And hence, this is really why we practice. Why do we practice these uh, strategies of collecting, quieting the mind and touching into the body and sensing the awareness that's here. When we come home to beingness, we come home to the source of where where all hope arises from. So what I'd like to do for the remainder of the talk is give you some stories and examples, because there's so many pathways back to that source of hope. Um, Examples that I found inspiring that really describe, uh, you know, the the pathway to beingness. And most of them, most of the stories are well-known people who hit bottom, but some are not well-known. But in some way they lost touch with their beingness and how they came back. And the common denominator, what you can track through each of these stories, are three elements that I 
brought up in the last talk that really comprise a full uh, experience of spiritual hope. And one element is that there's some aspiration or caring about healing or freedom. In each of these stories, something's triggered so that the person cares about waking up. That's one, the aspiration. The second piece is that they, in some way, contact their beingness, that that, that that trust starts waking up, that, oh, right here, there is aliveness, there is a sense of presence. And the third essential component of a full experience of hope is that then there's an engagement energetically. In other words, each of the person in some way align themselves to be available for the possibilities to ride those currents. Okay? So let's, uh, we'll just take a few of these stories and reflect on them together. But I would just want to mention on that third element that um, the receptivity and the sense of possibility that comes with hope is the precursor to all healing and awakening. In other words, if you're on a spiritual path, the sense of, oh, in some way we're intuiting it's possible to wake up, that this very heart and mind can wake up. We need to sense that possibility to then engage in a meaningful way that will actually allow us to flower. Hope is a precursor to the very activities that bring on healing and freedom. You can see it with uh, spiritual activism. I love Joanna Macy's new book, Act of Hope, because she talks about the sense that we need to be able to sense the possibility of the healing of this earth body, our enlarged body. We need to sense the long for it and sense the possibility of it. And if we are in that despair, we get isolated and we get despairing, we won't act. But if we start connecting with each other and sensing we care, it's possible, then we get engaged and we actually bring our hope into its fullness, into its flowering. I sometimes think of this image, I don't know where I got it from, but it's of a a straw that's in the Gulf Stream. And if the straw does not trust the currents it's in, if it's kind of at odds with the currents, it's just going to be tossed around and waste a lot of energy and it's going to have a rough time. But if it in some way trusts the currents and trusts how the currents are unfolding, it aligns itself, then the Gulf Stream flows through the straw. And in the same way, when we have some hope and trust in the way things are evolving, that allows us to align ourselves. It's not like our activity is ego-driven, it's more we sense what's unfolding and align ourselves so we become more of a channel for that, a channel for universal qualities of, of intelligence, a channel for love, a channel for creativity. When we're in flow, it's not from an ego, it's because we've tapped into something bigger, right? Okay, story number one. And this is uh, William James. And uh, many, many of you know he lived, uh, I think, 170 years or whatever. He came from a very accomplished family. And his brother Henry, hugely successful writer. Well, William was in his 30s and floundering. He was very unaccomplished. He'd wanted to be a painter, but then quit that and enrolled in med school. But then he quit med school to do a expedition on the uh, Amazon. And then he ended up giving up on that. So he had a moment of reckoning. And he kept a diary, so this is how we know about this. And he questioned his innate capacity to do anything productive in this life. In fact, he questioned if he should be alive at all. So this is a serious moment of reckoning. And um, so he was hitting bottom, but he decided he wasn't going to do anything rash until he tried something out. So he conducted a one-year experiment. And the one-year experiment was a lot like our little experiment, our reflection, where he basically said, I'm going to act as if there's hope. That was his experiment, that whenever thoughts, uh, limiting thoughts, you can, it won't happen, you don't have what it takes, he would just notice them, 
step out of them and just assume possibility, okay? So he was doing the as if things could get better and that as if allowed him to open to possibility. He started aligning himself, getting more engaged with what interested him. That year he married, he started teaching at Harvard, he joined a study group called the Meta Physical Club. He wrote a very buoyant letter uh, sometime later. He said, I possess for the first time an intelligible and reasonable conception of freedom. Okay, the freedom to manifest who we are. I mean, that's what the hope is. Hope is for the freedom to really be all we can be. So just to comment on his process, his way was he had some aspiration because he said, I'm going to conduct a year experiment. That means he wanted freedom, right? That's step number one. Step number two, he had a a strategy for coming back to beingness, which was to put aside the thoughts which really obscured presence, which is something we train in, you know, to notice the thoughts that are getting in the way. The Buddha said, whatever a person frequently thinks and reflects on, that will become the inclination of their mind. So do your thoughts, this is what we ask ourselves, do our thoughts uh, arouse a sense of hopefulness and openness and interest, potential, creativity? Or do we have thoughts that tell us what's going to go wrong and what we can't do that create doubt and discontent? Okay, so that was his strategy. And as that started to work, he started finding that when when those thoughts, the limiting thoughts, Uh, We're no longer obscuring what was here. His energy really woke up and he started aligning himself in a very kind of spontaneous, creative way and found his way to being really one of a great influential thinker of the century. Okay, so William James. Now, the next example is uh, what happens when that unfolding, what's really unfolding, Uh, includes horrendous loss. It's like when Rumi says, don't grieve. Well, what if there's huge grief? And um, I remind you of a story I wrote in True Refuge here of the woman whose uh, husband was dying and she was doing everything she could to try to fix the illness and bring every alternative treatment she could and then she had to give up on that and then she was trying to be the best possible wife with a dying husband and do it right and she came to a weekend and really asked me for Buddhism 101 on how you accompany someone. Uh, her, she and her husband were Catholic and practitioners of mindfulness and I shared that uh, teaching from Father Thomas Keating of when something arises, can we just say, I consent? So this is a mindfulness practice where you just notice what's happening in this flow of beingness, what's presenting, and you just say, I consent. So she went home to do that, but there was still a lot of conditioning to get things right. And one morning her husband said, you know, um, I don't think I have too long. And her response was, oh honey, you're doing great today so far, let's just have a cup of tea. And in the silence that followed, she felt a million miles away, the distance from her having kind of denied what was there. And that's when her aspiration got strong and it shifted from the hope that she'd do things right or the prior hope that she'd save his life, those are egoic hopes, to the hope of, may I love well. That was her prayer. That's step one, the aspiration. And then she started doing the practice and when the fears came up around his pain, she'd say, I consent and open. And when the grief came of this impending loss, I consent and open. You know, when the feelings of of, uh, self-judgment, you know, and shame, like I'm not, I'm not being so present, she'd open to that. She just kept opening and opening and she said, in that openness, she intuitively knew how to be with him. She knew when to sing to him and hold him and she knew when to be silent and she knew when to just pray with him. She knew. She was aligned. 
like that straw in the Gulf Stream, that kind of intuitive wisdom was flowing through. And as she put it, you know, she said, he's gone, but that field of loving is always with me. So she sensed into a possibility that was innately within her. So again, this comes back to our practice here. She tapped into that quality of beingness that allowed her to, to really uh, unfold in a beautiful way. And so it is that we practice the simplicity of mindfulness which enables us to notice what's going on, notice the waves of experience and say yes and open and reconnect with that, that oceanness, that space of awareness that can appreciate the waves as they come and go then we're available to possibility. Then we're available to really live from the fullness of who we are. 